Thank you very much, uh, particularly to the ISKCON uh, Swamiji's and Gurus, and uh, to the VHS uh, organizers here, uh, led by uh, many of our friends who are present here, and uh, in particular on the guidance of uh, Mr. Shri Ayer, uh, friends. Uh, who live in the United States and now taking the trouble to come to this conference. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you about the cow as part of a culture. We had been through almost uh, a 900 years of foreign attacks, aggression, loot, and in fact, even foreign administration. Of that, uh, 700 years of Islamic rule and 200 years of uh, British rule, which really uh, was indirectly rule of the Christians. India, before the foreigners came, was not hostile to other religions. In fact, it's a tenet of the Hindu religion that all religions lead to God. There's no other religion outside India. We have other India-born religions like Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism. And uh, we also have minorities like the Jews and the Parsis who came from Iran. And there was never any report of pursuing people of other religions in a hostile way. And if there was any disagreement, they were sorted out by what Adi Shankara called a Shastrat, which meant debate. And uh, when, they, for example, the British left India, they had gone to the Parsi community, the Zoroastrians, and said to them, you are a small community, and the Hindus are in like an ocean, and therefore we would like to leave behind some constitutional guarantees which we'll extract from the Congress leadership to protect you like we have done for the Anglo-Indians, where two Anglo-Indians are nominated to the Lok Sabha, and one to the Rajya Sabha, one to the Lok Sabha. And we'd like to give you that reservation. So the Parsis said, their priests, that for a thousand years we have been living with the Hindus. They looked after us. They met all our needs, such as helping build our temples. And we have never faced any indiscrimination or discrimination from the Hindus, and therefore we don't need your protection. The Hindus will look after us as they've always been doing. And you please go back to your country. We don't want you here. It's a great disappointment. <laughs> the same thing with the Jews. They were persecuted, butchered all over the world. And Germany being the most extreme example. But there was way, almost every country, the Jews were targeted. The Jews came to India, some few thousand Jews came to India. We received them and gave them place to stay in Cochin and in Bombay. Built their synagogues for them. And they stayed for almost 700 years. 
When Israel was founded, refounded, I should say, it is an ancient country anyway, it was refounded after the United Nations vote in 1948. And the Israeli parliament adopted its constitution. The first resolution they passed was to say, thank you, India, you're the only country which didn't persecute us Jews. So any religion which comes to India and peacefully lives with the Hindus, it's absolutely impossible to find the Hindus persecuting them or converting them or eliminating them. Christianity and, and Islam say very specifically, either my way or the highway. And in fact, uh, Islam through Quran, the Hadith and the Sira prescribe a violent end to people who refuse to convert. So to tell us that we are being intolerant when we are pursuing our ancient tradition is an absurdity and it has to be seen in the historical context. But we are recovering from these thousand years or 900 years of foreign plunder, loot, and forcible conversions and so on. And in the process, we are beginning to discover our ancient truths and bringing them back one by one. We were told many falsehoods. One of the falsehoods we were told is that Veda, which describes Saraswati River almost 10 times more than Ganga, doesn't exist. And the British made fun of us, saying, where is Saraswati River? But in the last 20 years, thanks to satellite imaging and lasers, we have finally discovered that Saraswati did exist and presently is underground. And now the Saraswati has been dug up and very soon you'll find Saraswati flowing to the Arabian Sea and the revival of Saraswati River. <laughs> we were told Sanskrit is a dead language. But today, if you go to Google, you can see it. And NASA has a journal called Journal of Artificial Intelligence. And in that, they say, after a search of 20 years, in to describe, to find out which language knowledge can be stored in a computer for artificial intelligence models. Because every language has some imperfections which the computer gets confused with. For instance, English, you, when you say P-U-T put, it is, uh, I mean P-U-T is put. And but if you say B-U-T, it is but. So the con uh, uh, computer gets confused by it. French perhaps is the extreme worst. I don't think it was ever meant for computers. And all the languages that they explored did not have that uh, compliance to the requirements of the computer to make it computer friendly. Finally, in 1988, Rick Briggs of the NASA wrote an article in Journal of Artificial Intelligence that now the search has ended. We have come to the conclusion that the most computer friendly language is Sanskrit and artificial intelligence on Sanskrit. <laughs> what was derided by Macaulay as a dead language <clears throat> and written off as having any future in a modern world. Today it's making a revival. I saw in the, in the Google search engine that there is a school in London called St. John's School, very respected, highly rated school. And there the principal has made the reciting of Sanskrit shloka compulsory for its students from the age of six to 11. 
I had this matter inquired. I sent my VHS friends in London to check. And the principal told them that the reason I am making our students repeat Sanskrit shlokas is that repeating Sanskrit shlokas during that age group of 6 to 11 develops the brain as nothing else develops. And that is why I am insisting on their reciting Sanskrit shlokas. So little by little, we are discovering, we discovered calculus, we discovered the decimal point, we uh, uh, made, uh, discovered algebra, trigonometry. In our entire history, which is at least 10,000 years, we never said that the world was flat and the sun went around the earth. Galileo made the mistake of saying, I think, in the 17th century, that the, it is not true. The sun doesn't go around the earth. It's the earth which goes around the sun. And the Italians beat him up, put him in prison, till he said, I withdraw my claim. But the Hindus never, never, ever said that the earth is flat and the sun goes around the earth. All through, they kept saying, that earth is round, it spins and does uh, the circumference, uh, circumference of the, uh, goes around the circumference of the sun's uh, uh, purview. And that there are other planets, they name these other planets, even the stars, it's all there in the Puranas. So what today when I'm speaking to you about the cow, is to place in perspective that the ancient wisdom is equally valid today. It is not something we have invented to harass the minorities or to show our hegemony in this society where today the Hindus are 82, Hindus plus other Indic religions like Sikhs, uh, Buddhists and Jains together represent about 82.5% of the population. It's not in attempted hegemony. It's that cow is a integral part of our economy. Cow is an integral part of our medicines. Cow is an integral part of our products that we need for building houses, for fertilizer and pesticides. Cow is our culture. That is the theme of your conference. And that is the background in which it is there. <laughs> now, <clears throat> it is not something that has been thought of by the Hindu fanatics to bring cow. It was debated in the Constituent Assembly. Mahatma Gandhi's view was sought by some of the members of the Constituent Assembly about whether we should go out of our way to include the cow in the constitution, ban on sl cow slaughter. And Gandhi said, even more important than Swaraj or self-rule, freedom from foreigners, the most important thing for me, he said, was the protection of the cow and it should be in the constitution. After a lot of debate, a lot of debate in the Constituent Assembly, finally Article 48 of the Constitution says that the government shall, as part of its responsibility of governance, pass a law banning the slaughter of cows. So it is there in the Constitution. It is not being imposed by any Hindu fanatic or any Hindu-minded party or any party which is wanting religious hegemony. And it was put in there because of this multi-dimensional value of the cow. This particular article was challenged in the Supreme Court as violating the fundamental rights 
of Muslims and Christians and others who wanted to eat what they wanted. And the Supreme Court in 1958 gave a judgment, a constitutional bench judgment of five judges, gave a judgment that first of all we make it clear that in India there is no such thing as an absolute fundamental rights to anything. All fundamental rights are subject to reasonable restrictions. And as far as religion is concerned, your fundamental right to worship is subject to three special conditions arising from public order, anything that threatens public order, out of morality, anything that offends morality, and anything that offends health. And that is on that basis that the Constitution Article 30 says that there shall be no untouchability in the country. And striking down one of the tenets in Manu's Shastras. At that time there was a revolt of some sections, but it was pointed out that the Constitution will not permit any absolute fundamental right. You have a fundamental right to worship as you like, but it should be subject to reasonable restrictions. And that is the principle we applied in the case of triple talaq when we decided to ban it. It was a demand of 50% of the Muslim population, namely the women. They had been asking for the last 70 years. No one paid attention. And as technology improved, triple talaq technology also improved. You could be divorced by an SMS. You can divorce by an email. Uh, so, therefore, the plight of the women became such that they could never tell when the husband, displeased, would, could uh, divorce you and leave you on the street. And we then acted on the basis of another article of the Constitution, which is Article 14, in which we say all men and win women are equal before the law. And on the basis of gender equality, we, uh, we decided to abolish triple talaq, and the Supreme Court upheld our view as constitutional. I would like to tell you that any government which is based on wanting to bring a renaissance, in our case, a Hindu renaissance, will be, never, will never hesitate to bring the modernity of the Indian constitution to bear on religious practices. If, as long as you do not have a religious practice which violates the other fundamental rights, such as equality, and those restrictions permitted, such as on health, morality, and public order, we will continue as a state to interfere in the religious practices of everybody in India if it offends any of the articles of the Constitution. As far as the protection of right to protect cows from being slaughtered, this is also a part of the reasonable restriction and the Supreme Court in its 1958 judgment has made it clear. Subsequently, when the NDA came to power in 1998, in 2003, a former retired judge of the High Court, Justice Loda, was asked to set up a commission and go into the entire history of the cow. And he wrote a four volume, I mean the commission adopted four volume, uh, four volume, uh, um, I wrote a four-volume treatise on the status of the cow. And another constitutional bench judgment also said that eating a cow is not an essential part of any religion in India, including Islam and Christianity. So those who say that it is our right to eat the cow, of course, uh, in my case, I would say 
I would only prevent you from eating Bos Indicus. But if you want to go and eat something which looks like a rhinoceros, I have no problem. It is Bos Taurus or any other breed. But the key breed is the Indian breed, which is called Bos Indicus. And it is this we want to pr protect. And it is this which has the greatest contribution to make to our culture and to our economy and to our health and to our way we conduct our agricultural practices. So today I want to wish, to wish to tell you that this is an idea which was there in the past. We have reviewed it and we have come to the conclusion that it fits in with our modern principles and it is something that we need to do for the sake of our society. It is not that only the cow slaughter is banned. There is another species we have banned by law, and no one protests about it, and that is the peacock. Peacock is, peacock, killing of peacock is banned. If you're caught killing a peacock, then you can go to jail for seven years. Because in that case of the peacock, partly because it was the vehicle of Lord Subramanya or Kartikeya, as it's uh, North India, Subramanya is called Kartikeya. His vehicle, and therefore we said it has religious significance, but more importantly, because of its meat being so popular, its feather being so popular as to be made into a, into a fan to which, with which you can uh, you know, remove your heat, Therefore, it was becoming extinct. I would like to say that because of the sense, the long, uh, vision of our sadhus and sannyasis of the past, the giving the religious sanction to ban the, the uh, slaughter of cows, the Indian cow, which is Americans sometimes call it as a Brahmin cow, it has nothing to do with Brahmins or the Varna Ashram or Dharma. But still, that is the name by which it is called, for a long time has been called here. And this ban that was put in, in throughout our centuries, even during the period when the 1857 revolt against the British succeeded, the first uh, farman that was issued by Badur Shah Zafar, was banning cow slaughter with capital punishment for those who violate it. When the Sikhs uh, began to triumph and Maharaja Ranjit Singh went to far corners, including Afghanistan, to invade and conquer them, everywhere the first thing he declared was that there shall be a ban on cow slaughter. And today, we must recognize that because through the centuries this ban was there, this precious species has not disappeared. I have been a frequent visitor to China. I uh, have made lots of friends there. I have studied China when I taught at Harvard. I taught, uh, one of the subjects I taught was the Chinese economy. I learned Chinese, and I was surprised during my first visit that I could not get milk in China. They gave me soya milk, and when, they gave, when I went to Tibet, they gave me yak milk, which I could not drink. After taking one sip, I nearly fainted, so it was something I couldn't touch. But I asked the Chinese, how is it you are our neighbor? And you don't have any cows in China. He said, and this Chinese told me, he's a professor, he told me in your country you had banned it. So there are cows. But in our country we never banned it, so whenever famine came in China, the easiest animal to catch and kill was the cow. And that's how the cow disappeared. So therefore, you want to protect the species. You may motivate people by saying religious, uh, religious thing that Lord Krishna was never without a cow. 
Lord uh, Shiva has got the Nandi bull. Like that you can say. Or you can extol the virtues of Kamadenu. But these are for explaining to the common man and getting his compliance quickly. And because of that, today we have 200 million cows despite almost 900 years of foreign occupation. And, and this is something we hold dear. Let me tell you, the Hindu civilization is unique because take the case of Persia, which is now called Iran. It was a 100% Zoroastrian country. Islam invaded, uh, invaded Iran, captured it, and established their rule there, and within 15 years converted 100% of Zoroastrians to Muslim religion, that is Islamic religion. Those who escaped to India are the only surviving Zoroastrians. But rest were all converted to Islam and today it is called Iran. The neighboring countries to Mesopotamia and Babylon, which together today are known as Iraq, in 17 years after the capture, they were converted to 100% Islam. Egypt was converted in 21 years. And Europe was converted to 100% Christianity in 50 years. But India, 700 years rule of Islam, 200 years rule of Christianity, and you're still 82% Hindu or associated religion. Because we fought throughout. It's not there in our present day history books. These have to be changed. And, uh, but we've, there was no part of India which did not fight. And they fought continuously. Earlier on, they fought with, with, uh, with uh, swords and spears and even rockets. But later on, Gandhi led the, the, uh, the opposition to the British and fought it through nonviolence because he felt we were totally disproportionately placed when it comes to military methods. And he thought this Satyagraha was the only effective way of making the, persuading the British to leave, and he succeeded. But the fact is that even Gandhi, for all his secular credentials, said to the Constituent Assembly that banning cow slaughter is to me is more important than Swaraj. That shows how deeply the Indians, the Hindus have felt about it. And today, in new form, we are bringing it back. And we do intend to do it for the following reasons. First of all, we believe that cow is a great additional support for the economy, and particularly the agricultural economy. It is a great support for the healthy lives of our countrymen. It is also a very vital addition, provides a very vital addition to even construction of huts because of the, the gober which can be converted into tiles and made into houses. And this has been demonstrated now. There was a Sarsang Chalak of the RSS by name Sudarshan. He once called what they called as cow conscious industrialist meeting. And he decided, he persuaded these industrialists who were, uh, were amenable to the idea of working to put cow as a central piece of the rural economy. And many of them produced these. Over the years, some of our scientists, finding our secular government in India not very responsive, came to the United States and got patent for cow urine as a me of medicinal value as a arresting of cancer 
and a variety of other things. You can see the US patent list by going to the patent office uh, website and you can download it. Otherwise, you can read my book, uh, Hindutva and National Renaissance, which I published about seven, eight years ago, which gives you all the details of various patents that have been taken. China, surprisingly, has also given a patent for cow urine as a way of uh, fighting disorders in the DNA. And that is patent for research. It's not yet been converted to use. So there are countries like New Zealand which are seriously considering that the so-called Brahmin herd or the Bos Indicus should also have uh, should also be protected by a ban. The ban is necessary because Arab countries have shown in the last 30, 40 years of our country's history that the cow meat of Indian Bos Indicus is perhaps the most delicious to eat. And therefore, there was a big demand for export of beef to India and you'd be surprised that for many years running during the Congress period, the export of beef was earning more revenue, except uh, jewelry, diamonds and jewels and so on, the cut jewelry which we were manufacturing after getting the diamonds. The diamonds were the number one, and number two was cow meat. And the government was giving handsome subsidies for it, and one of the first things I did after BJP came to power was to persuade the Congress, uh, the Commerce Ministry to withdraw those subsidies. And now the export of cow meat has come down to practically zero. <laughs> so I would like to say to you, that I am not, and I don't want you to, think of the protection of cow as purely a religious fanaticism. That it was there in the past, therefore wanted the future. This is part of our renaissance. We accept what is good in the past. In earlier shows on the screen here, and the last words of the, uh, the founder of the ISKCON, the great saint, that Varnashra Dharma is necessary. Even that, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, it makes it very clear that Varna Vyavastha, or the ka Varna system, the word caste is an uh, English word which has no meaning, because actually we have two concepts. One is called Jati, which is based on blood and used only during the time of marriages and to see that people of the same gotras don't get married. And the other is Varna. Varna is a division of labor. This was decided by two great rishis, Bhrugu and Bhardavaja. Both of them decided to devise a social system which will be stable and keep the society for centuries forever without being wiped out as Greece was wiped out, Italy was wiped out, the pharaohs in Egypt were wiped out. Most civilizations have been wiped out. UNESCO has tabulated 46 civilizations that have come into the world. Of them, 45 have disappeared. Only one remains, that is the Hindu civilization. So Krishna says, and this is what Bhrigu and Bhardwaja did, that Varna is based on gunas, not with janam, not with your birth. If you are born in a Brahmin house, doesn't mean you automatically become a Brahmin. You can. But that is by your gunas. So, Bhrigu formulated that for a society to be stable, 
you should divide the power of this country, the elements of power, and decentralize them. So he identified four sources of power. Knowledge, that is power. Weapons, that is power. Then wealth, that is power. And land, that is power. These four will be divided, decentralized, so that no one person will have more than one of this source of power. So if you pursue knowledge, you will not touch weapons, you will not seek wealth, and nor will you own land. That is how the concept of Jnani and Tyagi came in. And the highest order is that who is a Jnani, and a Tyagi. He may be born anywhere. Vishwamitra was born in a Kshatriya family. And he became a Maharishi. In fact, he became Rishi of Rishis. Nobody could challenge him. Even the gods were afraid of him. And uh, therefore, uh, even though he was born in Kshatriya family, Veda Vyasa, the Rishi Veda Vyasa who wrote the Mahabharata, his mother was a fisherwoman. It's there in the Mahabharata. There's nothing secret about it. Similarly, Kalidasa, who became the greatest poet and a Maharishi, that poet was originally a Vanvasi in the jungles cutting branches of trees till he was adopted and became a great Maharishi. Valmiki, who wrote the Ramayana, he was also a person who was a, originally a gangster. He belonged to, he was born in a Dali family. But there was a transformation. And ultimately, he became a Maharishi and wrote the Ramayana. Just because by tapasya you become a Brahmin, or get anointed as a Brahmin, it doesn't mean that if you break the codes of a Brahmin, you will remain a Brahmin. Ravan was a Brahmin. He was born not in Sri Lanka as Karunanidhi of Tamil Nadu thinks. He was born near Delhi in a place called Noida. There's a village even today you can go and visit called Bisrak village, sector 13 of Noida, where they put up a big board that Ravan was born here. And they don't celebrate Diwali, by the way, in that village. Having been born there, he went. He was not a born, uh, he was of course born as a Brahmin. But he went anyway to acquire the title of a Brahmin. He went to Mansarovar and Kailash, prayed to Lord Shiva who gave him a boon that nobody can kill him except for one secret which only his brother Vibhishana came to know later, which he parted to Rama, which Rama used to kill him in the end. So he went then searching where is the most prosperous part of India. At that time Sri Lanka was part of India. And his cousin Guber was ruling Sri Lanka. So he went and defeated him and became the emperor or the raja of Sri Lanka. This history very few people know. Karunanidhi did not know this history because he was banking on British written books. And he used, adopted Ravan as a Dravidian king, as a Dravidian god. And he, while we were holding Ramlila in the north, he used to hold in Tamil Nadu Ravanlila. Till I had long discussions with him, and one day he, after I produced the Tamil version of, of Ramayan, the Kamban Ramayan, he became convinced and he gave up. He gave up the <laughs> Ravanlila. But he was always against Rama because he was a North Indian. And he kept on saying bad things about him. And I said, Ram, Rama will teach you a lesson one day. And that came when I was arguing in the Supreme Court against touching Rama Setu. I said, you cannot, no matter what project it is, however economically beneficial it is, Ram Setu cannot be touched. I won the case. And Ram Setu, now the government of India has declared to the Supreme Court, they will not touch it. And now... (laughs) 
So when I was arguing this, he said, Karunanidhi said in a press conference, who is Swami to call this Ram Setu? Did Rama build it? Was he an engineer? If so, which college he went to? Now with this kind of mistake, Rama is not going to let him go. So next day he fell very sick and he was admitted to hospital. The name of the hospital was Ramachandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> he didn't have an MBA, BS, but still. Now this is the kind of ignorance has been fed into our people. And they come in order to debase our Hindu concepts without understanding. They think that it is what uh, the Hindu terror, if you say, don't eat the cow. That's a reasonable restriction. And that reasonable restriction is something that we are doing it for the sake of the country. And it is permitted, the Supreme Court has said so. Today, you know, without, or rather without you knowing, a lot of medicines, allopathic medicines in the United States draw urine of men or women from the public urinals, from the prisoners in jails. They don't tell you, but it is there if you read the fine print. So cow urine being used as, me as, uh, as medicine, why should anybody be afraid? It has been identified. The milk of the cow, which is now being known as A2, I have seen in my own eyes in some supermarkets in the United States. They are in cartons. The price is double that of the American cow. So, this Boss Indica's milk has many qualities. And these are all now targeted. I don't have to give you. And take your time, go, just go to Google and type Boss Indicus A2 milk, its medicinal value and patents. All that will come in your Google. This information is now widely available and it has been accepted. It is now being utilized. And so milk, urine, the gober, the excreta, is converted into fertilizer, pesticide, as well as bricks for building huts, solid bricks for building huts. So here is an animal which gives you everything. Why is it that you want, you don't want, you want this to be killed? The only thing we have to do is to see that the cow, once it has lived its, I mean it stops giving milk, you don't put it out on the street. The poverty in the country has made it to that. But times have changed. Now we can seriously think of giving a decent life to the cow by building gaushalas. People say it's cost a lot of money. I have told the government of India that you have put cess on petrol on all kinds of things. But one thing the Indian people, particularly the Hindus, will not object, and they are 82%, is if you put a cess on, say, petrol or some other commodity, because petrol is already too high in price, I don't want it put there, any commodity or every commodity, and say this is for building gaushalas, you will get ten times what you need from the people of India. So this resource is not the question. The question then becomes, what do we do to get it done? I have been urging the government to bring a all India law and to make it really effective, I said, anyone killing a cow should be prosecuted for murder. You'll be surprised to know that in 1955, the Congress party had brought a bill in parliament saying precisely this, a national law for 
preventing the killing of cows, the slaughter of cows, and death penalty. And it became clear by the speeches made that the entire parliament wanted this, particularly the Congress party. And at the last minute, Jawaharlal Nehru got up and said, if this bill is passed, I shall resign from my prime ministership. In the larger interest of India, people should have said, yes, go ahead, resign. We'll find someone better. <laughs> but the climate was such that the Congress party MPs backed down and that bill could never be passed. Recently, I brought in what is called as a private member's bill. Each member of parliament is entitled to present a draft of a bill that should be passed by the House. And uh, I, my, it is done by ballot because there are so many MPs, you can't give them all a chance. So there's a balloting. And luckily, mine came as number one. I'm talking about last January came as number one. So I got a chance to introduce the bill, which I had drafted already, and then asked for a parliamentary vote. So it was in Rajya Sabha. BJP doesn't have majority in Rajya Sabha. But still I said, let me see if I can persuade people to accept it. And I gave all these arguments that I'm giving you today. Surprisingly, even though my party government had asked this parliamentary affairs minister to issue a whip to all MPs of my party to say Swami's bill is not an official bill, so you should vote against it. All the MPs said, no, this is part of our agenda. It is there in our manifesto and we are going to vote for that bill. Not only this revolt, but I was surprised that the Samajwadi party, which is known for its most pro-Muslim bias, fielded one of its most outspoken Muslim MP. And he said, we Muslims are being wrongly told or ascribed to be against the cow. We have no objection. Like, we have asked for a ban on pig meat in our religion. You want a ban on cow meat for positive reasons. We have no objection. And Samajwadi Party is going to vote for Dr. Swami's bill. He announced it there. <laughs> now that left the Congress, which was sitting quietly. They don't like me because I'm prosecuting their leaders and sending them to jail. Very soon, many of them will go to jail. And probably the national executive meeting will have to be held in TR jail one of these days. <laughs> so I said, what has happened to you Congress people? You uh, are the ones, in, if you read the Constituent and Assembly debate, Seth Govindas, Shivanlal Saxena, Rajendra Prasad, K.M. Munshi, all these Congress tall leaders they argued for this inclusion of Article 48 of the Constitution. And today, you have changed. Why? When India became independent, for the election symbol, Congress chose two bullocks as, uh, as their symbol. In 1978, Mrs. Gandhi changed it into Gai and Bachada, that is a calf and a cow. And suddenly, with the influence of the Italians, you have now suddenly gone to some other symbol and forgotten about the cow. I think they were stung by it and surprisingly, Congress party also stood up and said, we will vote for your bill. It became unanimous. But then my party thought that discretion is better part of all. Instead of issuing whip, they came and spoke to me and said, you know, for the larger interest of our party's prestige, please don't press your bill, withdraw it. I said, why should I withdraw it? You had already issued a whip and nobody's bothering about your whip. Shouldn't we issue whip, whips like that? Should have come to me in the very beginning, but you didn't. They said, is there anything we can do? 
by which you will withdraw it? I said, yes. Make the Minister for Agriculture and Animal Husbandry come to Parliament now and say that we fully agree with Dr. Swami's bill, but we want to introduce an official bill. And therefore, in July, which after sitting with Dr. Swami, we will formulate a bill which will be a national bill for ban of cow slaughter. On that, I withdrew. I'm waiting for July to come. Otherwise, I'll bring again a private member's bill and get it passed. <laughs> now, you see, I would like to say in the end that we Indians made the biggest mistake in 1947 in not changing the textbooks. I mean, this cow problem we are having, why? Because the fashionable crowd thinks it is funny to say that I love my beef and I am right to eat whatever I want. Sorry, you don't. You don't have a fundamental, absolute fundamental rights on anything. Everything is subject to reasonable restriction. You can't have unreasonable restrictions, but you can have reasonable restrictions. Like you can't have narcotics. There's a ban on that. That's not interfering with your freedom. So why is this become fashionable to make fun of those who want ban on cow slaughter? I've given you so many rational reasons why ban on cow slaughter is necessary. We have 200 million cows. Because they are not well fed, the average yield of a cow in India is just 240 liters per year, 200 million cows, an average of 240 million liters. An average Israeli cow gives you 11,000 liters per year. Now imagine if our 200 million cows started giving 11,000 liters per year after being well fed, I can swim to California in milk. That much milk we'll produce. The price of Indian milk, which has supposed to have superior medicinal quality, which is now being widely accepted, is one-sixth the price of milk per liter in Europe. Imagine that if we were able to build cold storages, if you are able to pasteurize and bottle these milks, already in your supermarket, A2 is being sold at double the price of cows which have been brought here, A2, uh, I mean, uh, Boss Indicus uh, uh, cows. But from India, if we can put it, pasteurize it, put in a bottle, and fight in the WTO to see that we have given so many concessions in our import policy to the European export of goods, they must agree to our export of cow milk, which will be one-sixth the price inside Europe. How much uh, prosperity will come out of this? We will swamp out the, uh, the milk production in Europe. They can eat the, those cows if they want. They are not boss indicus, so I'm not bothered. And we can export that. Soon we can produce medicines out of A2, out of Boss Indicus cow urine. That also will be more effective medicines. There are, surprisingly, the Parsi community, even today in their wedding, the bride and groom have to drink one spoonful of cow urine. And there, that was an agreement between the Shankaracharya of Dwarka and the fleeing refugees who came to India. He had put down five conditions. One of them is, you will not touch a cow, you will not eat a cow. And even today, good Parsis never touch, talk about eating cow meat. So that was there with other religions. The Sikhs follow the same, the Buddhists follow the same, the Jains follow the same. It's only the foreign invading religions which disrespect our cultural traditions. If you allowed even our, those who are Muslims and Christians today, without the fear of the mullah and the 
a cardinal from getting orders from Vatican, I'm sure that they too will fall in line. They don't, they are not particular as I gave you the example of a Muslim MP on the floor of parliament. So I would say, why is this? Why do I have to argue what is so obvious? It is because of your brain. It has been the mindset of the Indian has been warped by the British deliberately. When Macaulay wrote that thesis minute on education, he said, I want an Indian who is English in manners, English in dress, willing to accept the English tutelage, but brown skinned, Indian in skin color. So that is systematically did in our history books that we always lost. Foreigners always came and took over India. I given you a brief part of the history. We are the only country which did not submit to Islam or Christianity. We fought and retained our culture. We are the only continuing civilization of the world today. These are not taught to us. The valor of Guru Gobind Singh or Shivaji or the Vijayanagar Empire or the Ahom dynasty, that is not there in the history books today. You will hear chapters of Robert Clive and Akbar and Aurangzeb and all this. But you will not get our valor uh, valorous people who fought Rani Jhansi. These are not part of our history book because the British built it that way. After independence and the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, there was no one left to challenge Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru. He was an Englishman in outlook. He himself said so. And the only person I know that he ever listened to was Edwina Baumbatten and nobody else. And she made him go and file that thing in the United Nations when Kashmir had seceded, not the country that had uh, signed the instrument of accession and merged with India, like almost 500 other kings. He made an exception for Kashmir at her suggestion and went and filed it. And today we have that headache of Kashmir's, Kashmir's separateness. So this brainwashing that has taken place, that has to change. And therefore, while the government is still producing and preparing new textbooks and will have new curriculums and certainly it will require another term in 2019 to finish it and execute it. But we need amongst ourselves to teach our children this new history. There are enough books which are not prescribed yet, but you can use them. And these, you can go to the website of the VHS India, you, uh, you will get all these references to. And change the mindset. I have a favorite story, a story I tell everybody about the mindset. If you have a thousand goats at one place and one tiger comes out before them, the majority is with the goats. They are thousand to one. But their mindset is a full of fear. So the moment they see the tiger, they all start running. And the tiger chases one of them and converts that into his lunch. If you see strong, well-built, healthy lions in a cage in a circus. A thin, wiry ringmaster walks into that cage, closes the door, and then starts ordering these lions, climb up. They all climb up on the, on the table. Then he says, open your mouth. They all open their mouth. He puts his head in each one of them. Not one lion bites his head off. Because from when they were cubs, they were brought up to obey, like we Indians, by this British education, to have an inferiority complex about yourselves. So he doesn't bite them. And this happens to human beings too. People used to ask me, your Manmohan Singh is your such a good friend, why is he so afraid of this Italian lady? I said, he is a Manmohan Singh, but he's a circus Singh, so therefore he will obey. He has been brought up to obey. Even if he is prime minister, sitting in the most powerful chair. This is what I think we are fighting. And to fight for the cow 
in a sense you are fighting for the liberation of your mind. You are creating a new Indian who is self-assured, who is self-confident, who can look at his past on merits and choose what he wants and choose and reject what he doesn't want. Nobody from abroad or New York Times editorial is going to make up his mind. That is what the cow, cow represents a revolution. It is our culture, but it is a renaissance that we are working for by arguing for the cow. Thank you very much.